I love the term millennials. Uh, I think most of here in this room can remember when they were called Generation Y, uh, but then somebody decided to call them millennials to give them sort of a Illuminati sort of feeling to it. You know, that they're, they're these unseen young people who are changing everything and destroying everything and ruining everything and how we have to market to them. <laughs> but I wanted to sort of kick this off with a question to Frank. You know, uh, authenticity. You know, this is a this is a point that you know I've heard uh, even in my coverage, and I can get into that more. But you know, what what is what will make this industry seem authentic to a millennial who's you know weighing you know whether I should go with a an, a, a, a human advisor, you know, an established firm, or you know select one of these robo advisor options that are out out there. So, can you talk about that? Thank you, Simon. Uh, one can learn so much from journey mapping and kind of digging into the moments that matter. And some of the things that come out include um, this whole notion of, of fee transparency, uh, doing what you say, what you say you're going to do, uh, clearly laying out the fees up front. In fact, some have even uh, talked about setting up. A compensation system that's not built around a product sale or around uh, assets under management but rather if you think of the millennial mindset as as subscription based right I'm, I'm paying for my Netflix subscription each month I'm paying for my gym membership each month is there some way to uh, create a compensation system where they're paying by month or by the hour uh, so it's not always an asset, because they don't have a huge number, obviously, of, of assets under management. So they're more in a cash flow mindset. Um, another issue is some of the small things that typically go unnoticed but, but are incredibly impactful. Uh, for example, many times an advisor will sit behind a desk. You know, and maybe that works with the silent generation or the boomers, but by gosh, with millennials, it's, it's as David pointed out, more collaborative. Let's sit around a round table. Uh, let's have a number of uh, uh, visual aids. Uh, you know. The numbers show uh, there's a large percentage of your generation who at the very least is toying with the idea of a robot advisor. Why would they, why would they go to why would they prefer basically, you know, a hyped up calculator versus having an actual discussion with a human being? What, 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 is, what would be the appeal of that? <laughs> right, so to me, I don't know that much about robo-advisors and, you know, the trust issue is a big thing, mm -hmm. but I find that absolutely fascinating that you could have an actual robo-advisor manage your, your assets going forward. And I think that's a huge thing with millennials, you know, we're a, we're a technological, uh, we're fascinated by technology our generation. Um, you know, so that's a big thing. So I think the fact that it said I would consider a robo-advisor versus I would actually use a robo-advisor, mm -hmm. I think that's why those numbers are so high. It's undeniable. I think it's, it's, it's touching different aspects of the financial services industry as a whole. I mean, you know, one of the other things I work on is asset managers. And, you know, I think uh, any active manager at this point is sort of, you know, trying to figure out a way to do what they do in, a, in an ETF wrapper because they know, you know, that ETF wrapper is going to eat them for lunch. You know, this is, uh, you know, costs are just, you know, they're, they're everybody's bugbear. So, and I, and I wonder how much of that issue of loyalty where, you know, uh, you know is, is tied to cost. Is it really about the brand or is it really for, for millennials? You know, I mean, when we talk about sh the sharing economy, it's really, is it really about, uh, is it really about the, the cost at the end of the day, not the relationship? Right, especially for millennials under, say, 25 years old who have a, um, a small amount of investable assets, um, you're gonna really want those low, if you're doing it yourself, you want those low commissions, obviously, because you know, your investable assets are much smaller, so commissions and, and trading fees are gonna cut into your, um, you know, your trading profits um, for the year. So I would say millennials under 25 who are doing it themselves, that's, that's a big plus that you see, um, especially if they don't trust you know, a lot of advisors and if they don't have referrals from family members, then and, you know they're doing it themselves. I think something tied to that was something that was that was, that the study brought up earlier. This point about how uh, these active well, millennials um, 
they are self they're self educating and that they will go and look out for things themselves. So Frank, I want to ask, um, uh, it, or you know, I, I've heard you know, if, I think advisors are going to begin experiencing if they haven't begin experiencing already what doctors call the WebMD effect. Uh, where you know you go to a doctor and you're like, I know exactly what's wrong with me. You got what am I paying you for? I looked it up on WebMD. These are my symptoms. I saw it online. And, you know, the doctors like, ah. I mean, I hear this. I have a lot of doctor friends, and they and they hate the internet uh, because of that specifically. Um, so, how, how how do you, as an advisor, sort of you know counsel and work with you know folks coming in who think they already know the answers? It's definitely there, and uh, I think David brought it up in terms of this collaborative effect. I, I think a good doctor will, would know how to field that question and, and roll with that situation, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to the old school doctor or the old school advisor saying, you know, there, 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 young one, I know what's best for you, which of course would be an instant turnoff. Uh, but but how to to start there and and to work collaborative collaboratively toward toward a solution that, that will benefit the, uh, the client. On that sort of theme and on the do-it-yourself and trust and all that, you know, where are money, Active Wealth Millennials going to get educated? Are there various places? Is there one place? Is it on a, a company's, you know, education center on their website or is it periodical? Yeah, wh where are they getting the education to do it themselves? No, it's really pretty, uh, pretty widespread uh, for what I use for reading materials, you know, everything from, you know, Wall Street Journal all the way to, to random chat rooms online, uh, you know, like trading chat rooms, um, you know, information is disseminated everywhere that I use, uh, and I think millennials who do it themselves uh, these days kind of kind of use everything um, that they can to, to make informed decisions. I would say, though, uh, from our experience, though, the research with YouTube seems to be quite a significant mm -hmm. source of actual information, so it's uh, people sharing either companies sharing information on YouTube or people sharing their experiences. So I think YouTube seems to be the place of choice for a lot of millennials. Yes. So in fact, everyone may know it's the second largest search engine on the, on the web. Correct. Uh, you, definitely. This is the generation that learned math through Khan Academy videos. Some perspective from uh, covering the industry. This is one of the points that uh, many of these automated investment services or online services make a point uh, of their of their business model to put that investor education out there first and to and to be seen as an educational tool that you know where you will learn these concepts and all these things and you know we'll explain it we'll hire you know you know people from my own industry get hired into you know into places like personal capital or whatnot to produce stuff that they would be producing for the Wall Street Journal now for these these websites so you get very slick very you know, elementary, but, you know, very clear explanations of things. And, you know, it's it's all about establishing your authority, right? I mean, this is the where the industry is in flux and where, you know, you have a, a market trying to decide what they where they want to go, where they want to put their money. It really is about communicating your value. And there are different ways to do that. Gosh, we could talk for hours about the nature of the conversation between an advisor and a millennial. I think there's a critical nuance. Uh, when it comes to boomers, uh, the silent generation, the older Gen Xers, this whole notion of retirement, even the word retirement, is, is so important. But step back and think, you know, from a millennial mindset, this word retirement is so far in the future. And it involves doing lots of little things over three to four decades. Uh, and I just raise this as a question, not as a prescription, but should we perhaps be when we talk to millennials, talk in terms of helping them gain financial independence as opposed to preparing for this thing way out in the future called retirement. I mean, it, we know so many millennials are entrepreneurially uh, oriented. We also know that they need uh, conversations and, and guidance in terms of establishing uh, positive cash flow, good saving and investing habits, budgeting, cash flow planning. Uh, so, so shouldn't we be, be speaking to those kinds of needs? Well, there's one company that you might have be familiar with, Openfolio. If anyone here knows, they basically their, their their whole business model is they've created a community of about about 25, 30,000 uh, investors, if you will, and they share their portfolio information with each other. 
you know. So, you know, and, and the idea of that is like, how is that even possible? Even when the guys who started the company, they're like, we didn't know that we would get any traction. But it's an idea that has not only gotten traction, but, you know, people think it's a great idea where they can sort of, it's a way of, you know, this expanding that, that whole idea of, you know, they trust their peers. You know, they trust their peers to the extent that, you know, well, if I want to, if I want to measure my portfolio, you know, I'll, I'll look at what other people are investing in as opposed to, say, you know, an index or a benchmark. You know, I want to see what people are, are putting their money towards. So there it, lots of things happening in the industry that may not sound good right. good for the individual. Or, but, you know, uh, the, the, the market is making, the market is making these things happen, you know, it's not like these things are happening in a vacuum. These are, mm -hmm. options are coming out because people want them. I don't want to be seen as a proponent for them, but this is why many of these uh, digital startups already have, you know, PFM app apps uh, built into their offerings, right? Whereas, you know, a lot of the banks or uh, other channels, you know, if you, if you, if you were to, and, and banks are beginning to get it now, but a lot of, a lot of online banks, they missed a big opportunity when they put their presence online, it was a simply transactional, right? Just, you know, you know what's, how much I have in my balance and, you know, okay, that's it. Whereas, you know, these, these, these startup banks, you know, it's like, okay, here's how much money you have in your bank, here are your bills and how much you could potentially save here and if you want to move this around. I mean, there, you know, these, these, these applications that are, deep, that, that are ingrained with the attitude that give us your money and we will also help you figure out how you need to spend it because that's what you really are worried about. You know, I mean, it's you know, simple idea, and yet for some reason, a lot of the established players ignored that, and this is the opportunity that a lot of these firms are exploiting. I mean, Jake, do you do you use any of these? Do you use Mint, or do you use any of these budgeting apps as well? Yeah, I'm actually, uh, this last week, I'm, I'm trying to get my siblings to use uh, both Openfolio and Acorns. I don't know if you guys yeah. are familiar with Acorns. It's uh, it rounds every every time you use your debit card, it yeah. rounds up to the nearest dollar and puts it in an investment account, uh, like a retirement account. And I think that subconscious um, way of handling a specific segment of your your future your future finances that you you know maybe you don't want to think about consciously right now, I think that's a big um, will be a big driver in the industry going forward. So like so like short-term priorities paying off your, your student loans and stuff like that that is what people are consciously uh, millennials are consciously thinking about um, so applications like acorns or open folio i think are are going to be like really really big moving forward uh, because you know you don't even really remember that you have the account until a couple months later um, and it's a really subconscious way to you know build up a, a nest egg over a few years you don't even really 